I don't know about all y'all, but I just take the stairs. Anyways, welcome back to another week of Ling 100. Today is Psycholinguistics. This is no doubt my absolute favorite lecture of the course, um, because this is the stuff I do. Uh, this is a mix between psychology and linguistics. This is diving into the brain in not the literal sense like we did last week with neurolinguistics, but more of the subconscious cognitive science sense. Like, um, what is the brain doing in the sense where we can't really go in uh, biologically and check neuron by neuron what's happening? Like, how is the brain processing sounds, words, sentences, and so on? So not only do we get to take a look at actual experimental evidence and data today, but we get to actually do some experiments ourselves on screen and not get to actually analyze results in detail, but get to just see how these things work. So um, because there is an extension on the neurolinguistics practice exercise and the assignment, I don't have anything to say about those today. Um, so those solutions will be available on Friday. Uh, after they're due. And uh, at the end of today's class, if there's time, I'll talk about the test two guide, but there will be a video that goes up tomorrow that talks about that in detail as well, if we don't get to cover it today, but I'll make sure there's at least a little bit of time to talk about it. Uh, and to talk about the changes that I mentioned uh, in the announcement, but I'll just reiterate those changes and what that will look like on test two, since details have been finalized. Okay, um, before we start, though, are there any pressing questions about last week's material that you would like me to cover before we start? I think we're good. Okay, I just never know how long someone takes to type a message, so I try to wait 30 seconds just in case. But if I see a long message in chat afterwards, I will pause. Okay, so psycholinguistics. Uh, psycholinguistics is all about these cognitive processes. So um, cognitive processes, these are things like attention, uh, memory, decision-making, and so on. So psycholinguistics has its own thing, like language processes in the mind. So we can break these things up into production processes. So like speech production, or we can talk about comprehension too. Like, can you understand the phonemes that are coming in? Uh, do you know that an E is an E, or are you perceiving it as like an I, depending on which sound your language has? Uh, when you hear words come in quickly, like you hear something like uh, this guy, are you hearing it as this guy or are you hearing it as like this sky? Um, and it's gonna depend on your first language and how fast people are talking and the context as to which you're hearing. You might even hear it as disguise. Yeah, depending on uh, what the final sounds are. Uh, this is an error that we have in the slides actually. And it's an error that was actually made in real life like a few days ago in my own life. That was kind of humorous and I, well, just ironic in a way because I put it in the slides and then in real life it happened to me. Um, so these are all the things we're going to be talking about today and just seeing some examples of experiments with each of them. So we're going to start by talking about sounds and then going up to words and then talking about sentences, just like uh, we did with the sounds, words, and sentences lecture. So we're going to start with a little experiment just to show you how language processing works. And this is a very simple experiment. Uh, all you have to do is look at the screen and not read the words that are on the screen. And not just out loud, but don't read them in your head either. Just look at the screen, but don't read the words. Okay, so let's, let's do this. Okay, so hopefully you didn't read that word. Uh, if you did read the word, let's just try this again. Okay, uh, one more time. Try not to read the word in the middle of the screen. Uh, if you're able to stare at the screen and not read the words, uh, congratulations, something's wrong. But 
it's very, very difficult. Uh, your brain just subconsciously reads words. So uh, if you can sleep with your eyes open, that's incredible. But what does this tell us about language processing? Well, language processing is subconscious. And I got to change the size of my text. So language processing is subconscious. Uh, you do it whether you want to or not. Uh, another way of saying this is it's automatic. So uh, if you're familiar with the language and your brain sees words or letters, uh, your brain will try to make sense of those words or letters. And this is something interesting. So your brain is just trying to do it no matter whether you want to or not. So what this means in terms of understanding how language works, uh, it means that we can't really just ask people about what they think in order to get real data about how language works. Because you do a lot of language work, language processing without knowing about it, without consciously doing it. Your brain does a lot of work without your awareness. And this is what we talked about at the very beginning of the course with inaccessibility. Uh, you know things about language, but you're not consciously aware that you know about it and you don't know how to explain it. Well, that's because a lot of stuff is going on in your brain that you're not actively aware about. So we need to do experiments. Uh, we need to find ways to tap into your mind, into your brain um, that can tell us about how you behave when you see language. So it's a very quick experiment that tells us a lot about language. It tells us how we have to access our minds and get data. So the first big split, and this is important and people forget about this, but it is a, a big thing. And that is production and comprehension are separate things. So what we mean here is that language output, so producing language and language input, understanding language are two separate streams. So when we produce language, we're producing sounds, we're producing words, we're trying to form meanings in our heads and we're trying to express them. So I in mean, a first language, this comes quite naturally, but there are certain errors that you make. So um, I make a lot of speech sound errors. Uh, that's something that is uh, that I struggle with. So I'll switch the sounds of words a lot, or I'll anticipate sounds, and uh, those sounds will bleed into other words. Um, other people have a lot of tip of the tongue errors where they can't figure out what the word is and they can't get the word out. Um, these are production errors. Uh, if you're an L2 speaker, normally you don't make uh, too many production errors per se. Uh, it's more just that you don't know the language that well, so you struggle to come up with the words. We wouldn't call those production errors. We would just say, you know, you're learning the language, you're having difficulties with it. Um, but the errors and the difficulties you have with comprehension are a little bit different. Uh, there's no real creativity there. Uh, you're listening, sound is coming in. You have to discern phonemes. So your perceptive abilities are going to mess with how well you're perceiving sounds, uh, how well you know words are going to determine which words are activated by those sounds. We'll talk a little bit more about the le mental lexicon today. Um, you know, there's differences between how old people talk and how young people talk. If you learn a second language and you listen to old people, uh, it can be really difficult to understand what old people say at first because they usually slur a little bit more they usually talk a little bit quieter and they mumble, they're a little bit raspier and they use older language too. So it can be a little bit tougher to understand them. And that comes in with this incompleteness bit. So an interesting fact, and this might blow your mind, this thing about speed here. Uh, when you listen, you listen to about 200 words per minute or 15 sounds per second. 
So that's what the average first language listener is listening to and understanding. So there's a lot of room for error there when you're listening. So when you hear something like this guy and you hear the sky as in the air rather than a person, and you're only making one mistake in a minute, like that's pretty incredible to hear, um, you know, what 60 times 15, 900 sounds in a minute. Yeah, 1.5 times speed. You're increasing that even more to what, uh, 1350 sounds or yeah, 1,350 sounds per minute. Like that's a lot of sounds. So there's a difference between output and input when it comes to experiments. So specifically, we'll take a look at uh, speech production and speech comprehension. Usually with phonetics and phonology, we make a big distinction between production and comprehension. When it comes to syntax and words, we normally sort of group them together, um, which is just how the field is. Uh, is it problematic? Yeah, kind of problematic. Uh, do linguists care about that at the moment? Eh, not really. But hopefully within the next 10, 20 years, things will change a bit because there do seem to be differences, but it's just not that big in syntax right now. So um, there's different ways that we can get at production. There are natural ways and there are experimental ways. So there are reasons why you'd want to use one or the other. Um, with naturalistic production ways, what you're doing is you're just um, observing people in a normal environment. So uh, you might be listening to them in a normal conversation and recording the errors they make. Or you might be asking them just to name things in a picture or have them read a book and you're just recording them in a normal environment. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice way to get descriptive errors. And it's, it's very cheap. Like you don't really have to do anything. You don't have to create anything. You can just go out in the world and you can collect these things, collect these errors. Um, experimental production is more interesting. It's more controlled and you can try to elicit errors. So uh, if you have uh, predictions or theories, you can test them. So for example, if we think that uh, we can get an error out of someone by giving them a bunch of words that sound similar and then give them a particular word that's a little bit different and we can try to force them to make an error, uh, then we could produce an experiment around that and see if it happens. And then we could make some theory about how sounds work and how words work. So. Uh, you know, we use naturalistic errors to create theories and hypotheses. And then we use experiments to really test those and push those limits and create theories about how those errors are actually formed. So um, naturalistic productions inform us about theories to test with experiments. So, uh, Real world data gives us reason to get experimental data and test things. So we'll talk about uh, not necessarily all of these, but uh, about four of these. And we'll get to see some examples of a lexical decision task, uh, sort of a priming task, and we'll definitely get to see an example of an induced speech error task. So uh, let's talk about some speech errors. Okay, um, there's two types of speech errors that people tend to make. Uh, we call these selection errors and ordering errors. Selection errors are just when you pick the wrong word or wrong sound. And ordering errors is when you do have the right words or sounds, but they're just in the wrong order. So as we go through each one, you can think about which one it is and the practice quiz this week will ask you specifically about what each one is. So the first one is a blend. 
Uh, blends are fun. Blends are actually how we create words in languages all the time. So uh, blending is nothing new to people. It's just that blending is also a way that we produce errors. So this is usually what happens when you have two words in your mind at the same time, and you can't decide which one you're going to say. So you end up saying both of them at the exact same time, and you get a word that just isn't real. So uh, this example here, they left it hangling there. Uh, you meant to say hanging, you wanted to say dangling, but you said them both at the same time. So instead of just saying hanging and dangling, you said hangling. Or uh, that's a cute dog, that's a cute puppy. Uh, you might say that's a cute doppy or that's a cute um, pug or cute pug. I mean, if you say cute pug, that's a real word. So you might not say that, but you might say that's the cute pug or a cute poggy or something. So that might happen too. It's a cute poggy. Two words in the mind, you say them both at the same time. That's a blend. So like there's no necessarily consistent pattern about like which words or which sounds happen in which parts of words, but typically it's like the first half of one word and the second half of the other word, um, but things can get mixed up. Uh, the second one is a spoonerism. And spoonerisms usually are within four to five words, so they're pretty close to each other, or sometimes they can even be within the same word. But this is when you have the first sounds getting swapped. So what a beautiful flutter by. So in this case, uh, the F and the B, instead of, well, it's really not just the F and the B, but the whole onset here. So flutter by, butterfly, the F and the L here, those are getting swapped uh, instead of butterfly, flutter by. Or you could also do, you have tasted the whole worm. So these are real words, tasted and whole worm. In fact, this is a real sentence. This is fine. But the intended word or sentence was, you have wasted the whole term. So the W and the T were flipped, but we got real words out of it. So you have tasted the whole worm, was meant to be, you have wasted the whole term. So yeah, uh, bam herger or bees trigger is another example. That's a good one. Um, uh, cheeseburger to bees trigger is another good example. Uh, and these can be real words or fake words that come out of it, a, a, a make back, yes. Yeah, so you can flip any of the onsets of the beginning of syllables around and you'll get a spoonerism. So uh, I don't know if you watch any like kids TV shows, these are often like the joke. It's like, oh, they did a spoonerism. It's funny. Put on the laugh track. Kids will love it. It's good comedy. If you ever want to write kids TV shows, put them in there. So these are the first two. Uh, there are three more common speech production errors that are made. Uh, one is a malapropism. So this is what we saw with people with paralexia last week. Uh, this is sort of similar. But instead of it being words that are similar with uh, you know, content and form or content or form. Uh, these are usually just form based. So these are just words that look similar. So the boxer got a severe industry in the fight. Well, this doesn't make any sense, but it looks like the word injury. So it has the same sort of IN prefix on it and it ends with a Y. So injury, industry, these look pretty similar. Or uh, I need an inflection on my paper, inflection and extension. These look pretty similar. These both have the I-O-N endings, extension, inflection. You know, these both have this N sound in them. So they're not super similar, but they're close enough. About the same amount of letters, same ending. So 
So sometimes this happens just because it's similar, but a lot of the time uh, malaprop malapropisms will happen uh, because you don't know the word for sure. You're not completely certain about it. Um, so you'll produce a word that's not quite the same. Um, these errors are for production. This is when you're talking. This isn't for reading. This is just when you're speaking. Do we see a word mentally when we say it? Since this error is for ones that look similar. Uh, some people see words mentally in their heads. I don't know if everyone does. Some words, some people do not see text in their heads. That is all I know. I don't know exactly how everyone thinks. But these production errors are, are for actual speaking. So this is when people speak things out loud. Um, these are errors that are made between uh, when people think about it in their head to when it comes out of your mouth. So you could say that this is like an error from the mind to the mouth in between that process. Yeah. So they look similar, which means that in some sense, they sound similar. Since although, although reading and graphemes don't correspond perfectly to sounds, um, there is still some consistency in writing and pronunciation. So I realize when you ask the question, it's because on the slide it says words that look similar. Um, really, it should be that words that sound similar to some extent. But because I have everything on the slides that I, I said look similar, yeah. So I'll just write sound there. That's good. Seems similar. Look, sound similar. There you go. Both work, but this is about the actual production of sounds. Okay. Um, the last two errors are very similar. And these are probably the most common errors that are made. Uh, these are called anticipation errors and preservation errors. So these are when you have a sound in mind from a future or previous word and you keep that sound in the pronunciation of another word. So um, anticipation is when you're thinking of another word that's coming up in the sentence. And you use that pronunciation for an earlier word. So for example, uh, put the trash bands back. Put the trash bands back. This should be a C, trash cans back but you're thinking about the B in the word back, so you bring that B ahead in the sentence. So you're saying, put the trash bands back. Or it's, it's a Paul problem. It's, it's a Paul problem. Okay, this should be a small problem, but you're thinking of the pr in problem, so you're taking that pr and you're anticipating it and you're bringing it back. So you're saying it's a pro problem. It's a pro problem. So these are called anticipatory errors or anticipation errors. And we say this is regressive. So regressive means it's going backwards, regressive errors. Okay. Um, what about when you're writing, typing something while someone is talking to you and you end up writing what they're saying instead of what you meant? Um, at this point, I think this is more of an intention, or sorry, of an attention and working memory error where um, what they're saying is just in your working memory instead of what you're thinking. So you just end up typing what they're saying. So it's not so much a, a production, like, I mean, it is in the production line. Uh, it's just that their language is occupying your attention resources rather than what you're thinking of. Okay, um, the other, the opposite of anticipation errors are preservation errors. 
So instead of thinking about something ahead of the sentence, you are ahead in the sentence, you're just producing sounds and you're holding that sound. So instead of saying phonological rule, where it should be phonological rule, you take that sound and you bring it ahead. So you're saying a phonological fool instead of a phonological rule. Or instead of that'll be 50 bucks where this should be a B, you hold that F and you bring it ahead. So you can imagine what that would say. So uh, that can happen too. And the reason I use phonological fool here with the PH, again, I just wanna emphasize that this is not about spelling, of course, this is about the sounds. So even though PH is written PH, it's still the F sound. So the F sound is being held um, ahead. And actually, Trevor, why is there a curse word in the slides? Is this for humor or is this actually for uh, a teaching purpose? It's actually for a teaching purpose. There's a, there's a reason this is in here. Um, errors with curse words are actually less likely than other words. This is a fact and it's an interesting fact. Um, any sort of speech error, uh, if you're producing an error and it's going to produce an error with a curse word, you're actually less likely to make it than other errors because your brain subconsciously, for some reason, I think it's still, I shouldn't say for some reason, for a sociolinguistic societal, you know, um, uh, social, psych uh, social psychology reasons, uh, wants to filter out taboo words, curse words. So we'll see this with spoonerisms as well. Um, if you're going to flip the sounds of two words around, uh, if the output is a curse word, you're much less likely to make it. So an error with that'll be 50 bucks, preservation error is actually going to be less likely than making an error like a phonological fool. So it can happen, but it's not as likely as something else. Curse words stand out more. Um, yeah, so I mean, the brain is aware when you have curse words. Uh, the, the brain knows the difference between curse words and non-curse words. For instance, when you say curse words, when you experience pain, uh, there's less pain in the body. So the, the brain is aware of curse words and the brain doesn't want to produce curse words in certain situations. Are there some sounds where anticipation preservation is more likely to happen with than other sounds? Um, I think it would depend on the language, but um, it's more just that some people are more susceptible to errors than others. If you use curse words a lot, I think the association does become weaker. It's also going to depend on uh, who you're around. So if you don't use curse words in more formal situations, then you're gonna be less likely to make them in that situation. If you're around friends and you make those errors, then you're gonna be more likely to make them. Uh, so the reason we're talking about speech errors too is that Dr. John Alderetti at SFU studies speech errors. Um, so we do have a speech error lab at SFU. So if you are interested in linguistics and in speech errors in the future and you do continue on, um, there is someone at SFU who studies these and he studies them specifically in uh, Mandarin and English, I believe, or is it Cantonese and English? It's, it's one of the two. So not only English. Uh, what about stuttering or repeating the first part of the word? Uh, stuttering or repeating. Um, so stuttering is its own thing. Uh, stuttering isn't really a mental lexicon error. Um, stuttering is, uh, or repeating the first part of the word. Uh, these would be their own category. Yeah, you could, you could classify stuttering and repeating as its own thing. These are a little bit more linguistically interesting for us because um, these take other words as input. So anticipation, preservation, uh, malo, um, sorry, uh, spoonerisms interact with other words. Malapropisms take other words and blends combine two words while stuttering is just the repetition of one word or repeating is just within one word itself. Okay, so let's take a look at what sort of errors 
we could produce. Um, if we take these sentences or words and we apply these speech errors to them. So, I mean, these are, these are nice ones that we can type on like some of the other exercises in this course. So uh, if we take the sentence, go and take a shower and we make a spoonerism out of this, uh, what is the result going to be for this sentence? So really what I should do, and I should be more specific with this, um, it's not just the S here, it's the whole first sound. So it should be sh that's being swapped for the spoonerism here. So yeah, go and shake a tower. This would be our result. For go and take a shower, the spoonerism would give us go and shake a tower. So these are real words, shake and tower. So this is actually a pretty likely error that someone could make. Go and shake a tower. Uh, what if we swap jelly beans? What would we get? If we had a spoonerism for jelly beans. Oh yeah, belly jeans. Mm. <laughs> belly jeans on my logo. Okay, what about a blend of marvelous and spectacular? So we have a, a few options here. So what are some nice ways that we could get a blend out of these two words? Mar attack you lar mectac you more mar tacular spec spec lores spec plus yeah there's I mean there's so many ways we could do this um spectalus spec tabulus I mean Perhaps when, when we think about the likelihood of these two words being a blend, it's probably not going to be that likely just because these words are fairly long. But when we think about one of the more likely ones that we'll get, uh, marvelous, spectacular, usually what we'd have happen is it would break somewhere like at a syllable boundary. So marvelous, spec, ha. Q lar. So we'd end up with something like martacular or martacular or spec ha list or something. It seems it, it might be difficult to actually find a blend in real life with these two words just because they're so long. But I mean, it could happen. There's a lot of different ways it could come out. Okay, so now to distinguish between preservation and anticipation. Uh, I'm going to take a run. So let's do anticipation first. So yeah, remember anticipation is when you're anticipating something later in the sentence. So you bring the sound backwards. So I'm going to rake a run. Which means that with preservation, we're going in the opposite way. We're preserving that T and we're bringing it to a later sound. So with the T, we would get, uh, I'm going to take a ton, which I guess if we wanted to, we could write it like that. But it doesn't matter how we write it. The, the sound would be something like, I'm going to take a ton. So these are just some examples of, of the errors that could come out. Okay, are there any questions about these ones? Okay, we've only talked about five different types of speech errors. Uh, and normally I don't say things like, yeah, check out Wikipedia for more different types of things. But um, the Wikipedia article on speech errors is actually a really good article on speech errors. Um, like the chart is very concise. Um, so 
Uh, there are some more things. Uh, there, a lot of them are, are pretty similar, but uh, you know, there, there is some more information if you're interested in different types of speech errors. But these are the ones that are linguistically relevant to us at this point. Uh, is a person with speech errors more likely to do just one or two of these, or are they more likely to do all of them? Um, no. Uh, it's not usually all of them. Some people just have a, a few that they do repeatedly. So like the ones that I usually do when I speak quickly are anticipatory errors, or I have difficulties coming up with words. Like these are the two that I do. Um, uh, usually anticipate, anticip anticipation errors are much more likely than preservation errors, for example, because when people think ahead with words of what they're going to say, it usually, usually the sounds of words coming ahead are more likely to, um, what's the word? Ah, there's a difficulty right now, tip of the tongue syndrome. Um, uh, the, the words ahead are more likely to be in the mind and affect words that you're saying now than words that you said before that you're uh, trying to say in the moment. Um, so when you cannot come up with a word, that's tip of the tongue syndrome. Uh, the term difficulties coming up with words or the loss of words that we talked about last week is like um, uh, anomia, when you, lot, when you lose the ability. When you just have difficulties in general, I'm not quite sure if there's a term for that other than people just experiencing tip of the tongue quite frequently. My specialty is um, not sounds, but rather sentence structure. And more so on the comprehension than production. So. Unfortunately, the production terms I'm not very familiar with when it comes to like those specific differences. Okay, so we got another experiment right now and I'll tell you what the experiment is after. So I want you to actually try this if you can, if you're not embarrassed because you don't have people around you. Uh, this might be a little bit fast. So if you stumble because this goes a little bit fast, that's okay. Uh, that's sort of the point of this experiment. So I'm gonna show you words on the center of the screen. I want you to try to read these out loud as fast as you can. So if it goes fast, that's okay. Do your best to keep up. And try to listen to yourself, see what happens. Okay, did anyone notice anything or did anyone do it? Stumbled there. Okay, so if, if I try to do this, I don't know if I'll have difficulties with this, but um, ship haul, short haul, sheet hem, should have, hot shirt, ship haul, sheet hem, short haul, hit shed, sheet hem, ship haul, short haul, heel shelf. So unfortunately, uh, I've done this too many times that I don't have any issues with it. Um, but this is an experiment designed to get people to produce spoonerisms. So uh, usually what happens is participants are able to do it at your own pace. So unfortunately, because I'm controlling the Zoom call, I can't have you like do it on your own. Um, but normally you just go as fast as you can. And then as soon as you finish, you hit the next one. And uh, what will happen is with some words, like um, uh, this word, some people will produce a spoonerism here. So hit shed. Uh, this is actually a less likely one to produce because if you flip the two onsets here, uh, from hit shed, you get shithead. Um, 
if you compare this one, you'll get Hort shawl. This isn't a real word. Uh, heat shem, not a real word. Uh, hip shawl, not a real word. Uh, shot hurt. This is a real word. So hot shirt becomes shot hurt. So those are two real words. So this experiment is designed to get people to produce spoonerisms because the words are very similar. So if you go really fast, you'll start swapping them up. Okay. So the results of this experiment sort of ties into what I said before, is that people will produce spoonerisms, but um, if the resulting words are rude, so um, what was it? It was hit shed. Then they're less likely to produce the spoonerisms. So uh, just to really like uh, make this explicit, um, hot shirt is more likely than shithead. So I'll just spell that out. Um, even though both will be made, more people will produce the spoonerism for hot shirt. Sorry, that wasn't hot shirt, that was shot hurt. So um, that's the result of the experiment. But it's not just the result that's interesting. It's, it's what comes from the result. Because remember, with psycholinguistics, with our production errors, like, cool, this is what people do. Uh, this is the production, this is the behavior. But what psycholinguistics is interested in is what's actually happening in the mind. How is language stored in the mind? Uh, how is language processed? So the final result from this experiment is that, okay, inside our mental lexicon, um, inside our language processing system, we have some sort of filter, some sort of system that tells us, you know, okay, what are real words, what are fake words? So we have some system that distinguishes between real and fake words. That's great. And we also have this system that tells us that, okay, we have words that are appropriate and words that are inappropriate. So even when we're making errors, we still have this system that tells us whether words are appropriate or not. And also, spoonerisms are more likely if the words are real, then if the words are fake. So for example, shot hurt is more likely than uh, shelt hort. So two interesting facts from that. Real words are more likely than fake words and errors, and polite words are more likely than taboo words or rude words. So even when we're making errors, um, our brain still processes real language. It still monitors it. So I don't know how many people would expect this uh, before doing any experimental results. Uh, this is always surprising to me. I mean, you're making speech errors. Like in, in my mind, before I knew any of this, it's just, okay, you're just swapping sounds. Like that's all it is. You're, you're producing a bunch of sounds in your mouth. You make mistakes with your muscles and then the wrong sounds come out. But it's not just that simple. Uh, <laughs> you're more likely to make a mistake when the mistake results in a real word. And that word is polite. Like it's, it's, it's truly amazing how, how, how the brain like functions. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Are there any questions about what, what speech production errors tell us about our brain or how speech errors work?
okay, so to sum this up, what I do want to say is that it is more likely that real errors occur more than like fake words, but errors will still occur with fake words. It's just less likely. It still happens though. It's not impossible. It's just less likely. Okay. Um, so one, one further thing. Because we didn't really talk about this, but this is um, this is the further point here. And that's that within a word, you can also have speech errors. So, I mean, we talked about the one thing with the spoonerism with flutter by, but we can also look at like morphemes. So instead of like easily enough, we can swap morphemes around too. So easy enoughly, or instead of forgotten about that, we could do like forgot about in that. So this is actually important because what this tells us is that when we're building sentences in our head and we're building words and we're trying to say things and express ideas, the building blocks, the fundamentals of our language it is not the word, it's actually the morpheme. So because we can move morphemes around to places that where they shouldn't be, uh, we're actually thinking in morphemes. That's how we're building things in our head. Uh, you feel like you do this one? I mean, I, 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 think, I think most people do this at some point. Uh, morpheme mistakes happen. I don't want to say all the time because that's not accurate, but th these are the ones that I think people notice. And these are the ones that people make fun of when, when they hear. At least that's, maybe I just have bad friends, but these, <laughs> these are the ones that I get made fun of when, when I hear it. Um, I don't know, speech errors are very common. Uh, I think, uh, again, I, I, I I relate all these things back to like second language learning. And when I hear, because I, I read so much about people learning second languages and producing it and saying like, oh, I make so many errors and I feel bad and I'm embarrassed to talk about it. And it's like, well, first language learners make mistakes all the time too. It's normal. And these are the errors that first language learners make. So when you're learning a second language, just talk, just make mistakes. It's totally normal. Everyone does it. Uh, it's just the errors are a little bit different. First language learners make, or first language speakers make these types of errors. And second language learners might not make these types of errors because then why would they say about? It's never going to happen, but they still make errors. Okay. Um, what's the next slide? Mental lexicon. Okay. It's a little bit different. So why don't we take a 10 minute break now? Then we'll come back and we'll move on to the psycholinguistics of words. Sounds like a good plan. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll take them after the break. So you can type them out in chat and I'll answer them or you can save them for voice. But I'll see you in 10 minutes. That's a butterfly, not a horse. What a great line. Anyhow, let's continue. So back to the mental lexicon. With speech errors, this does give us a little bit more information about how our mental lexicon is organized. So last week we talked a little bit about the mental lexicon. So how words are stored in our head by looking at uh, neurological language disorders. But these speech errors give us some insight too. So with word substitution, so substituting words like early for late, so words with similar meaning, uh, you know, with uh, language disorders last week, we found 
that people can do this. So this was uh, last week, this was lecture six with neurolinguistics, and this week with malapropisms, so words that are similar in form. So we know that meaning and form are how uh, words are connected to each other. So you can think of words being like this network or this spider web. So here's a nice little picture of how things are organized. So you could have like a mammal, and then you have all these different types of words that are related to it. So um, animal is, you know, a mammal is an animal. And then a cat is a specific type of mammal. So it was a whale. And then uh, water is connected to whale because whales live in water. But um, we could also have, say, uh, words that sound similar to. So uh, whale is similar to the word hail. So uh, hail could also be connected to whale in this case, um, just because they're similar in form. So uh, that's another way that these words can be connected in our mental lexicon. So in this case, we've taken both like actual evidence of language disorders and speech disorders. So psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics to inform us of how words are stored in our brain. Okay, so yeah, here's the, here's the this guy is falling comic I talked about that was ironic in my life because, or sort of coincidental in my life because uh, the interpretation here was this guy is falling. Oh, this sky is falling. Sorry, this should be not this guy, but the sky. So this guy can sound a lot like the sky. So the reason this happens, and I, we can actually explain this phonetically now. Um, the end of these words, this guy. Uh, S and G. This is a voiceless sound. So this is an S. S and G is a voiced sound. G, G, G. There's vibrations in the throat. So in English, um, a lot of the time, the sound after wants to be the same as the sound before in some way or other. So what can often happen is the voicelessness gets spread over. So that way, the next sound also wants to become voiceless. So that is why this sounds more like a k to people. This guy is falling. So guy ends up sounding a lot more like sky. It's because when you hear sg, your brain is like, well, usually that's sk. So a comprehension error can occur because your brain is thinking, well, this pattern is more likely. But with the right context and with enunciation, that can change. So why is this error likely in this context too? Well, it's also because when you say something like the blank is falling, or just even the this is falling. Well, that's like a, it's a template. The blank is falling. Normally you wouldn't say guy. Um, the sky is falling is like a regular phrase that is used. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. It's a regular phrase that is used in media. So if you say this guy is falling, you're already primed, you're expecting to hear sky. So when you hear this guy is falling, your brain's already expecting the word sky. Guy comes in, it's sounding close enough to sky. So your brain is like, okay, it's sky. So real world expectations can actually affect how you hear things too. So um, uh, real world expectations and, um, and expectations about language can affect your comprehension.
uh, should expand this a little bit more comprehension of certain sounds in certain contexts. So just make that as specific as possible. So a little detour there, but um, another important point about comprehension compared to production. So there's just one thing we're going to talk about with comprehension compared to production. Um, with production, there's all these different types of errors like malapropism, spoonerisms, anticipatory errors, preservation errors. Uh, with comprehension, on the other hand, we just really talk about one error, which is like a general error that we call a slip of the ear. And this is just mishearing what someone has said and this is like the conventional sentence that everyone introduces the error with so i will as well uh, this is what people hear they had slain the, the early of Murray and lady mondegreen but what is actually said is laid him on the green so people hear Lady Mondegreen, but what is said is laid him on the green. So um, these happen all the time. Uh, you hear people say something and you mishear it as something else. So usually if you're unfamiliar with the words that are said or if someone speaks fast or if they have uh, an accent of some sort that you're not familiar with or if you're not paying attention to them that well, uh, then you might not hear what they say accurately and your brain is trying to fill in the gaps or just make sense of what they said. So uh, I like to just go on YouTube and watch the misheard lyric videos sometimes. They're humorous. Uh, you'll find many of those for your favorite songs uh, in every single language out there. And you'll find a lot of differences. So uh, this is from Dancing Queen, ABBA, Someone sees, see that girl, watch her scream, kicking the dancing queen instead of digging the dancing queen. Uh, sweet dreams are made of these. Here we have sweet dreams are made of cheese. Here's a misheard lyric. So just people mishearing things. So again, we don't really have lots of different types of these. It's just a slip of the ear. You misheard something. And of course, if you don't know what a word is, so let's say you hear something like, I don't know. Uh, let's say you only know the word float. And then you're a second language learner who hears a word like bloat. So you're an L2 learner, you hear the word bloat, but you only know the word float. There's a good chance that you'll hear the word bloat and you might interpret it as float because you don't know what bloat means and B is pretty close to F. So that's an example of a slip of the ear or a misinterpretation because you don't know the word. So um, these things can happen too. Yeah, even though you know what the actual lyric is, you can still sometimes hear him saying something. Else. Yeah, so even if you know what the right word is, sometimes you can still be tuned to hear something else, so you'll hear something else as well. And this is an example of priming that we'll look into in a moment. Okay, so not too much for speech perception errors, but that, that wraps up speech perception. Okay, um, so now let's take a look at reading. So not, not dyslexia, so we're not going to look at people with... Um, uh, reading troubles. Uh, what we're going to look at now are studies with people who have no difficulties with reading. So I'll just make sure that this is explicitly typed out. Um, in all studies, everybody, or sorry, in all studies, nobody has difficulties with reading. Okay. So uh, there's some facts that we just take for granted. These have been proven, but we're taking them for granted. 
And that is, as we read words, uh, we try to pronounce them in our head. So uh, that doesn't mean that we're seeing them visually in our head, in text or images. So we're not making any assumptions of how we think uh, in terms of what we see in our minds. All we know is that um, we're activating the sounds in some way as we read them. So whether we hear them in our head or the nodes in our head are activated in some abstract way, um, some sounds are being activated in our mind as we read. And that has been shown linguistically. So there's ways that we can study reading. Uh, we can do this very cheaply, or we can do this uh, more expensively. So an expensive way is through eye tracking. So this is this is expensive. This is like between thirty to eighty thousand dollars to get a machine. Our department has a couple of these eye trackers, and uh, it's really informative. It's just difficult to set up and difficult to interpret the data, but very powerful. Uh, you can do uh, tachistoscope studies, which some people do in psychology. I haven't seen these in linguistics in a long time, but you just flash words on a screen as fast as possible and have people like subconsciously read them. Uh, or we can do self-paced reading. So we're going to take a look at uh, the top and bottom one, and we'll go into detail. But this is how we can study how people read. So uh, I saw someone post this earlier in the course, and we're going to take a look at this one. So I'm sure most of you can read this. And if you can't read this, I'll read this out loud for you. Uh, according to a research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Well, this is somewhat accurate, but there are a few things So there are a few things that are done in this write-up that haven't been discussed. So I'd like to point those out. Um, one thing that makes this very easy to read, and I, I'd like you to also look at this and tell me how many words in this paragraph are perfectly in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two. 32 of these words are in order, which is about a third of them. So yeah, the function words are in order. So yeah, um, most of the function words are in order and are, and yeah, most of the function words are, I shouldn't say are in order, but are spelled normally. Um, and these are grammatical words. So basically they're telling you, um, you know, where the content words are going to be. So really all you're doing for most of the work is figuring out what the content words are, but the grammar is, for, is already being done for you. So that helps. Um, here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. Uh, they're this way because the first and last letters of those function words are in the right places, though. Yes. So that's another thing. Because the first and last letters are in the right place, a lot of the function words are going to be spelled normally. So this helps. Um, but uh, that, that's a huge thing. Because these function words are small, a lot of them are in order, which makes it easy. So... That's why I say it's somewhat accurate because it helps, but there's another big thing. And maybe this one is a little bit 
more unique. Uh, I want you to compare this. So here's Cambridge spelled normally. And here's Cambridge spelt above. Okay. Um, now here's another scrambling of the word that we could do. Which one is easier to read? One or two? One. So look at so look at the letters in this paragraph, the letters that go above the middle and below the middle. So what I mean are letters like G and H and L and T and P and Q, letters that go above and below this line. What you notice about these letters is that they're always where they should be. The shape of the words are roughly the shape of the normal words. If an L is at the end of the word, it's always around the end of the word. If a P is at the beginning of the word, it's always around the beginning of the word. Look at the word university. Why is the T at the end of the word still, university? Why isn't it the T at the beginning of the word? If I type in, uh, if I put you here, you to nervousy, it's a little bit harder to read. A little bit harder. Not that much harder, but a little bit harder. It would make it much harder to read this entire paragraph if we move those B's, G's, T's, and everything around. So that's why I say this is somewhat accurate. Um, so the shape of the word is consistent with the original shape. So what I mean here is like uh, P, T, K, L, Q are roughly in the same spot. So that's why this is so easy. Um, it's not just that the first and last letters are in the same spot. It's not quite that simple. There's more going on. Uh, it's the fact that function words, for the most part, these grammatical items are still very easy to read because they're in the right order and they're in the right position. And also because the general shapes of the word are still normal. It's it's you know like it's it's set up in a way that is easy to read. And this goes on the internet and it's you know it's it's believed by a lot of people that this is just a fact. And then you'll reread these things where people change up the order and suddenly it's very tough. Um, but this is the reason why it's easy. This reordering So yeah, I said I'd talk about this a little bit later in the course, and here's where we talk about it. So if you ever see this again, uh, you can explain to your friends and family why this happens. Okay, here's experiment three. Oh, any questions about this before we go on? Okay. So again, um, the main thing, the main question is how are words in the mind linked to each other? And we have a pretty good idea right now of how that happens. But again, the more evidence is good. We really just have evidence from neurolinguistics and speech production errors. But um, if we can get some evidence from meanings, so not just sounds, 
So not just form um, and not just uh, language disorders, but from people that don't have any language disorders and just from people that uh, understand you know, what, what words mean and have connections in their brain and can decide if a word is real or not. Um, so from able-bodied people and able-minded people, um, you know, how, how are words linked together? What, what, what even is in a word entry in their head? You know, when they have the word cat in their head, sure, cat is linked to dog and cat is linked to animal, but what else is in cat? Is it just the sounds? Is there some sort of description of a cat in their head? Um, these are like really simple questions, but they're, they're not easy to answer because again, we can't just ask someone. Uh, when you think of cat, what's in your head? Because again, language is subconscious. There is some conscious stuff we can ask people, but that doesn't give us the whole picture. So uh, lexical decision tasks and priming tasks ask us about word recognition and word meaning, but mostly word recognition. So here's a base fact. Uh, it takes about a third of a second to recognize a word. And adults can read about 250 words per minute. So, you know, when, when you submit an essay, that's, you know, a thousand words, it takes about five minutes to read your essay. Usually it's read a little bit faster, fortunately. But uh, when you ask, you know, how long are your TAs spending marking your work? It's usually about the amount of time they spend marking it. So sort of a sad, a sad realization. But this is about how fast people read. Sorry for the, the sad truth there. Okay. Um, yeah, let's take a look at each one of these tasks. So um, here's an interesting thing, and this is actually a, an important assumption for our tasks. Again, uh, we're talking about real language here, uh, speech, understanding words that are being spoken to us. So when we listen to people speak, we hear sound by sound, syllable by syllable. So we understand words while they're being spoken. So if you're about to say something like linguistics, as soon as I hear you say ling, 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 I understand linguistics. Like in my head, my brain is already going linguistics, even though you've just said ling. So the brain is activating the word before you finish speaking, which means that when you're doing a psycholinguistic task like priming or lexical decision and deciding whether something is a word or not, or whether something is related, you can do the task before someone has finished speaking the word. This also means that any assumptions you're making or any decisions you're making um, or any thoughts that you're having, these are being formed before someone else is finished speaking. So um, yeah, we'll talk about each of these in details, but lexical decision task is going to say, well, how fast can we determine whether a word is real or not? Okay, so this is actually interesting. Like how fast can humans decide whether a word is real or not in their first language? So is, is it in my dictionary in my head or is it not in my dictionary? Uh, and second, the priming task is gonna tell us, well, um, I just saw a word before. Uh, and if words in my head are linked to other words in my head, then if I saw the word which before, then words related to which should come up more easily because I just saw which. So things related to which should be activated in my head because I just thought about which. So broom should be activated and potion should be activated. And because which is similar to, uh, I don't know, lich, then lich should be there because it sounds the same or which is similar to the word watch. So watch should be activated too. Um, if words that sound the same are also activated. So like, that's one of our guesses, right? We said that, um, Words similar in form are active, are together in the mental lexicon. So which should be close to watch. So if this is true, 
then yeah, if, if I see which earlier, then which should influence watch a little bit later. And we'll, we'll talk in detail about what this means and what this looks like in the experiment. So let's let's take a look at this and let's do this again. Um, and, and I recommend you do this in your head or, or you can do it in chat if, if you want. So I'm gonna show you some words on the screen and what you have to do is you just have to tell me in your head or in chat if it's a real word or not. And for each of these, you should be doing these in less than a second. So like really like go as fast as you possibly can, which is why I say maybe do it in your head because it'll be faster in your head than what you can possibly type. So let's uh, go in three, two, one, word one. Okay, we're gonna do word two and two, one. That's a real word in two, one. It's not a real word in two, one. That's a no, that's in two, one. That's a real word in two, one. That's a real word in two, one. That's not a real word. And two, one. That's a real word. And two, one. That's a real word. And two, one. That's not a real word. Okay. So I want to talk about each of these actually. So, pineapple. Uh, this one was a no but it sounds real. So it might've taken a little bit longer to say no, but you still, you still should have said no. Um, this one would have been a fast yes. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a real word. It's a fast yes. Uh, fox, this would have been no, but this would have been a slow no. Why would this be slow? Well, it's slow because it follows um, English spelling rules. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to use the word that we actually used earlier in the course. Um, it follows English phonotactics. So it could be a real English word. So because it could be a real English word, you see the word, your brain says that could be English, and then it has to decide yes or no. So that's why it's a slow no. Because it's not like, uh, you know, like, no, that definitely couldn't be. It's like, it, it looks like it could be English, but I don't have that word in my brain, so no. It's a little slow. Uh, the next one. Uh, this is a fast no. This is a fast no, because we can't pronounce the RD at the beginning of a word. So we know immediately that's not English. That's not going to be an English word. Linguistics. Uh, this is a fast yes. We see linguistics. We know it's a word. You read this as ridicule? Oh, you might have been prime then, but that's interesting. Linguistics would have been a fast yes. You see this word, you're like, yeah, that's a word. Bundle. This would have been a fast yes as well. You see bundle, you're like, yeah, that's that's a word. The next one, what we saw next was splundle. This would have been a slow no for two reasons. One, English phonotactics is followed, but two, primed by bundle. So it looks like bundle, so you're expecting a yes, but it's not actually an English word. So that's what makes this a slow no. First, you're like, this follows English rules and it looks like bundle. So you're expecting yes. Your brain is really like, yes, I want this to be an English word. So you're primed for this to be yes, but it's no. So this takes a lot longer for you to say no than the other words. 
So there's a lot going on in your brain here. This experiment is really like messing with your perceptions and, and really priming you and trying to mess with you. That's, that's the point of this. I'm, I'm trying to mess with your brain here. Apple. Yeah, this is a fast yes. You're like, yeah, Apple's a real word. Fantastic. Easy. Next one, banana. This is a faster yes. Believe it or not, if, if we actually timed you with this, this would be faster. Why? Primed by apple. It's also a fruit. So banana is ready. So it might not be that much faster. In fact, it, you're, consciously, you probably don't realize it's faster. If we tested you, it might be like 80 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds faster. But it would be a little bit faster. So uh, if, if we did apple, we did banana, pear, orange after, you're ready for the fruit words. The fruit words are already activated in your mind. So when you see any fruit word after, you'd be like, yes, that's a word. And then finally, gallo. Um, this one would be no. And this would be a slow no. So English phonotactics followed as normal, but there's a second reason. Does anyone know what the second reason why this would be slow? Primed by banana, why? Yeah, banana is yellow. Uh, exactly. So, um, even though banana is a fruit word, when you think of banana, you still think of the color. That's something that's activated too. So all bananas are yellow. Maybe it's like a, a light green or whatever. But when you think of a banana, you think of yellow. So yellow is activated in your mind. You see yellow. So you're like, yeah, phonotactics are there. I have yellow in my mind. So that should be there too. So I want to say yes. But hold on, yellow is not a word. So this should be no. So it takes a little bit longer. Yeah, and you might think of gallo too. So there's a case too where gallo also looks like another word that is an English word like gallo. There's another one that I didn't quite think of, but sure, that works too. That's how you spell gallo, right? Not gallo. It's been too long since I've watched any ship-related shows. Okay. Yeah, so I thought I'd just run through that experiment with you piece by piece. And I mean, we'll talk about the actual results here, but it's good to sort of talk about it before looking at just the results. So uh, that's the point of the lexical decision task is to see how long it takes to react to saying yes or no. Um, so to, to sort of run through experimental terminology here. Uh, we have these things called independent variables and dependent variables. I'm not going to harp too long about what these mean, but independent variables, if you take other experimental research courses, and here's, here's the summary. An independent variable is what you control. It's what you manipulate. So in this case, uh, we're choosing, is it a real word or is it a non-word? So are we choosing clouds for real words or are we choosing non-words like click? Uh, so in the experiment, it's like, are you choosing yellow or are you choosing banana? So that's what we're changing. Uh, for dependent variables, what we're measuring. So if we actually did the experiment on a computer and you're recording things, we would record two things. We would record your reaction time or what we call response latency. So how long it takes you to say yes or no. And you know, that's why we said fast yes, slow yes, slow no, and so on. Okay. Um, so that would be response latency is how long you take. The other thing is response accuracy. So whether you're correct or not. So this is, you know, if you say yes to a yes, then it's like a check. If you said yes to a no, then you'd get an X. And then at the end, you'd get a score. So if you said yes, uh, so if you've made the correct choice 90% of the time, you'd get 
if you said uh, if you made a mistake like 50 percent of the time you get 50 percent so what does it mean when i said yes to words that weren't real words because i assumed i just didn't know what the word was uh, then you'd get a correct uh, you get a response accuracy score so um what the response accuracy score is usually for um this is usually for choosing which participants data to use so this is as an aside um but usually when you do response accuracy it's like which participants were paying attention to the experiment and focusing on it so if someone has a really low response accuracy score you just assume they weren't paying attention so then you don't use the data because you assume they didn't understand the task or they weren't paying enough attention to the experiment so you'd say like anyone over 80 percent you keep and anyone under 80 percent you throw away whether that's objective or not listen there's a so it's, it's social science for for a reason you didn't hear it from me but that's just what happens okay but what we're really interested in here is like the response time yes or no how long does it take So here's, here's, here's the interesting bit. And I'm going to start at the bottom because this is the most like important point. Uh, if you have a real word, they're responded faster to than non-words. So the yeses are faster than noes. So real words, a yes is going to be faster than a no. But um, within the yeses, there's this thing called a frequency effect. So what this means is that when a word is more frequent, you respond yes faster. So for example, if you compare the word the or cab with a word like turmoil or I don't know, like competent the words the and cab are going to be faster than turmoil and competent because the and cab occur more frequently in english than words like turmoil and competent so when you see a word more often you respond to it faster so this suggests that in our mind the words that we need to use more often are more easily accessible. So our mental lexicon is organized also according to frequency, usefulness, efficiency in a way. You know, our, our, our mental dictionary is efficient. When we need to use something often, uh, it's available to us, which makes sense, right? <laughs> It'd be kind of pointless if our mental dictionary was like, hey, you never use these long, complicated words. So let's make those easy to recognize and let's make difficult words like the really difficult for you. That would be horribly inefficient. Um, so the brain is just like, hey, you use these words all the time. So let's, let's make those easy for you. So words you use often take about half a second to say yes to and words that you don't use that often take about three quarters of a second. So it's not a big difference. But it's about 50% longer. Uh, and furthermore, for the non words, so these are within the yeses, um, within the non words, uh, pronounceable words are slower than non pronounceable words or unpronounceable words. So, like, um, yeah, the example I have there is like tloop and tloop, uh, tloop will be faster than ploop or plup will be slower. And this is like uh, what we saw earlier with, with um, phonotactics. If it follows the phonotactics, you're like, hold on a second, this could be an English word. And then you say, no, it's not. While with something like tloop, you know, you're like, hold on a second, that's definitely not an English word because you can't do T-L-U-P, you can't do tl. 
So of course it's not going to be an English word. Like, no. So unpronounceable words are going to be faster for a no. So yeses are faster than noes. More frequent yeses are faster than less frequent yeses. And unpronounceable noes are faster than pronounceable noes. And this gives us an idea of how we can access words, how words are stored in our head abstractly. So any questions about lexical decision tasks? Yeah, non-words are the least frequent words, of course. The frequency effect can technically explain everything. You literally never say floop, but you could possibly say ploop. But I mean, I guess it kind of breaks down with the non-words because floop is faster than ploop. But if you, if you group them together, it kind of works. Yes, question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, let's just say, I remember like when I was younger, there'd be a word that I came across, like, you know, that random word. And I'm like, oh, I love this word. I'm going to remember it because it's absolutely useless, but I just like the word. And because that word is like, I specially pointed it out and I wanted to remember it and it just becomes kind of special in that way. Uh, and I come across a word and I would react probably faster to that um is that priming or is that something else entirely like would that be considered priming um in a way yeah you're priming yourself to it because you're you're, okay. you're hunting for it um yeah yeah you are you are priming yourself for it uh okay. I, th I think i think there is another official term for that i can't remember it off the top of my head um there, there is a term for when you learn something, and because you learn something, you find it places. Mm -hmm. Okay, because yeah. I was thinking, like, okay, let's just say I did a lexical decision task experiment, and that particular word luckily shows up, and I'm just like, I know this word right off because, you know, this, this, and this. Um, but it's not because the, within the experiment it primed me to do it, but I just, from a personal experience, I know and immediately know the word is a word or not. Yeah, um, actually in a lexical decision task, what would probably happen is even though you're ready for the word, you would still likely perform normally, even mm -hmm. though you're ready for it just because the previous words within the experiment are not related to it. And because you're focused on just those words. Right, so the, okay. Yeah, the immediate words that happen are very influential on what you're doing. Okay. All right, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 Bader Meinhof phenomenon when you learn a word and then see it everywhere. Yeah, so that's a little bit different, but that that does happen a lot too. Okay, so I do want to talk about priming before the break. So we did talk about priming in terms of like the actual when we went through piece by piece. So just to explain what priming is in case uh, that wasn't made clear when we go through it or when we went through it. Um, priming is when we take some stimulus, which we call the prime. So this happens before. Uh, and there is some target afterwards. So uh, for instance, we had Apple. This was the prime. Afterwards, we had the target, which was banana. And uh, the point of the prime is to prepare you for the target to see if the target is activated or recognized faster after the prime. So the prime is there to prepare you for the target to activate it in your mental lexicon. So what this is supposed to do in terms of psycholinguistics is to see if the words are connected in your mind. 
So if you have like this complex web in your head and you have Apple and you see Apple and you're like, okay, this is activated. And then you have banana over here. And when you activate it, it like spreads over here and there's like activation of banana. Then when you see banana, you're already like, oh, I have no banana in my head, it's activated. So this goes a little bit faster. So um, yeah, if, if Apple primes banana, then you get this thing called a priming effect, which just means that um, Apple makes banana activate faster, which means that you process banana faster. So it just helps. A, a more colloquial way is it helps in the processing of the target. So the prime helps in the processing of the target. Uh, another way that I always thought of priming was the word preparation. The prime prepares you for the target. Uh, th there can be things like negative priming where a prime uh, misleads you, but normally in linguistics we think about positive priming. So the example here is um, you give them the word bread earlier, and then when they see the word butter later, they're prepared for it, so they process butter faster. But if they didn't see bread first, then when they saw butter, it'd be like a normal time. Um, okay, so like uh, with these ones, uh, how close together does the prime and target have to be? Uh, that's a good question. So it varies depending on uh, who you talk to, whether you're doing a psychology study or linguistic study, oddly enough. Um, it also depends like if you're like how complex the words are sometimes. Uh, usually what I hear is within five to seven words. Is typically. Uh, what it is, because that's about how long people can remember things well. So it does have to be in working memory. So the, the closer it is in working memory, the more recent it is, the stronger the prime is going to be. So if we take a look at these words, we ask ourselves, are these more similar in semantics or phonology? Okay. Uh, so if we think about like bread and butter, these are closer semantically. If we think about mouse and Morse, we would say these are closer phonologically or orthographically. We'll just group them together. Uh, land and band, phonologically, cat and dog, semantically, and then might and bite, phonologically. So, uh, whether it's semantically, phonologically, or th orthographically, um, all of these can be priming targets. So might can prime bite, cat can prime dog. So whether it's like similar sounding or similar meaning, we can get priming from that. Okay. So, um, this will be the last slide and then we'll take a, a 10 minute break. But uh, what I said before about production and comprehension is that we understand words even if they're not fully spoken or listened to. So this works even with priming. So for example, if you're saying the word captain, or captive, but you only produce capped. So you're midway through uttering captain or captive. The brain doesn't know which one you're about to say, which one it's about to hear, but it prepares itself for both. So it doesn't know whether it's gonna hear captain or captive, but it prepares itself for both. So what will happen is it will, it will prepare words, it'll prime words 
depths for captain and for captive. So kept would prime pirate for say captain uh, or sailor, but it would also prime a word like prisoner or jail for captive. So it would prime say those four words as example when you just hear capped. But if you just hear captain, if you get the full word, suddenly it no longer primes prisoner or jail. It would just do say pirate or sailor, for example. It would no longer prime the word similar to captain, or sorry, uh, for captive. Uh, is orthographic similarity the same as phonological similarity? Uh, we can treat them as the same, uh, just to make things simple for us. Uh, really, really no. Um, sometimes words are spelled the same, but they're not pronounced the same at all. But for our sake, in this context, we'll just keep it the same. So priming works even when there's half utterances. Um, if, if I ever ask you a question where they say a half word, I'll tell you what word they're about to pronounce and what it sounds like. So that way you don't have to search your brain for like a billion words that it sounds like. Um, and priming even primes morphemes. So like trombone contains this morpheme bone in it. So it will also, so it not only primes words related to trombone, but it primes words related to bone as well. So trombone would, you know, prime music, for example, but it also primes rib, just like bone primes rib. So trombone is going to prime everything that bone primes. So, um, yeah, there's like a, if you have a large word with a lot of different morphemes inside, it's going to prime all of those little morphemes as well. So are there any questions about priming so far before our break here? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back, we'll finish priming and then we'll do some uh, sentence stuff. And that'll be it for psycholinguistics. So I'll see you in 10 minutes. Dots on the racing line. The track at exotics, they have various cones around it, braking cones, apex cones, exit cones. So by looking ahead, Okay, the, the last bit with the eyes is actually something that we're going to see uh, in the end of this lecture. So a little foreshadowing. Okay, to finish with priming, we have this set of words, the new distance, the new distance. And you can prime words within other words, in fact, across words too. So the new distance, does anyone know what secret word is being activated here? The new distance. The new distance. I'll, I'll give you a hint. Uh, the word that is being primed. So, so there's a word in here um, that would prime the word naked. Nudist. Nudist is correct. New distance would give you the word nudist. So yes, you would get nudist from new distance and that would prime a word like naked. So yeah, uh, you can get words primed across uh, word boundaries as well. That can happen. So um, even though we, we're just getting a string of inputs in our ear, right? And we're just building words from that. So the new distance, the new distance. Nudist comes into our ear, so we get activation from that. Uh, so that happens. Um, also, if words are ambiguous, so like the word pitch, for example, 
we get a bunch of different activations there as well because pitch can have so many different meanings so all of the different meanings will be activated and as we get more information we'll start crossing things out and deactivating them so as we talk about a pitch and we're told okay uh yeah did you see the pitch did you see the pitch okay when we say see the pitch suddenly sales pitch oh sorry sales pitch might be in there but sound pitch is going to be crossed out so see the pitch and then you might say in the stadium okay suddenly sales pitch is gone and then we're just left with baseball pitch so context can uh, can rule out other interpretations so just a little bit more information about priming based on all of the stuff that we talked about so far in this lecture it's really just all about how the mental lexicon is formed so we get meaning similarities form similarities frequency uh, these are all things that inform us about how our words are stored in our mind so words that are similar in semantics so cat dog animal words that are similar in form uh, industry injury cat mat watch, which, and words that are used in frequency. So the cab sheet is going to be uh, activated faster than turmoil, catastrophe, um, flounder, for example. So a bunch of different studies to help support the same conclusion, which is what you want in, in a science. You want as much evidence as possible. You don't just want one study in one area to give you a result. Uh, you want to take a lot of different angles, a lot of different approaches, and as much evidence as possible. So that was words and sounds. Are there any questions about priming lexical decision task mental lexicon? Okay, feel free to type as much as you want if you have any questions. We're going to go on to sentence processing now. This is my area of familiarity. At least what I spend the most time with. Uh, unfortunately, because syntax is very complicated, a lot of the really fun stuff, well, the stuff I find fun, which, you know, it's fun is fun is a very subjective term in syntax very very subjective uh, we can't get too into it um, but we can talk about some of some of the base stuff which is still interesting um, so when we build sentences in our head uh, it's very different from theory and we don't know theory that well which is actually a good thing so we can actually talk about it more more natural we hear just words piece by piece so the child that i saw yesterday was playing blah 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 so as we hear words, we build up sentences in our heads piece by piece. So when we hear the child, we think, OK, this is like a noun phrase. We don't have to worry too much about what these mean. This is just some syntaxy terms. The child that I saw yesterday, so that I saw, that I saw yesterday, these are modifying child. That I saw yesterday is modifying child was playing this is describing what the child was doing so we're doing this piece by piece and normally when we listen to people we know what parts of the sentence are doing and what they're modifying based on prosody so prosody is like intonation so the child that i saw yesterday was playing compared to the child that I saw yesterday was playing. Like the way that we speak is, is um, no, like the intonation that we use tells us where we are in a sentence and what's describing everything. So if you do wanna know about these things, an NP is a noun phrase. We did see this one earlier in the course. A uh, rel clause is a relative clause. So these aren't things that you need to know, but if you are wanting to know, uh, that's that. An adverb is an adverb. Um, okay, so when we put these words together into like this syntactic structure, into a grammatical sentence, this is called syntactic parsing. So 
Um, the key word here is parsing. You parse a sentence. Okay. Um, when you're reading, however, reading is a little bit different because we don't have intonation. We don't have prosody. We don't have someone speaking the sentence out loud that gives us hints. So, uh, for instance, when I say, I saw an elephant in my pajamas, we don't know if in my pajamas is describing what the elephant is wearing or if it's what I'm wearing. I'll, I'll type this out. Uh, I saw an elephant in my pajamas. Like that's an ambiguous sentence. And prosody would tell us which interpretation it is. I saw an elephant in my pajamas. Well, that interpretation would say the elephant's wearing my pajamas. But if I said like, I saw an ele I saw, uh, I saw an elephant. Or, it's, it's I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to force the saying now, and it's weird because I'm thinking about it consciously. Uh, yeah, I saw an elephant in my pajamas. I'm sorry, it's, I, I can't I can't do it. I'm consciously doing it now. But based on how we say it, we can force a particular understanding. We'll see other examples of it later with garden paths where I can actually do it. Yeah, text to voice. So when you get things like Siri or the um, text to speech on like Twitch or YouTube, when you listen to people do it, like, uh, hello, I am a donation reader. Uh, it's a little weird because the prosody is all wrong. Or call 855-5213. It's, it's weird. It doesn't have the right intonation. Okay, so with reading, the first thing we have is a self-paced reading paradigm. So uh, with self-paced reading studies, participants read a word at a time or a group of words. And basically what we're tracking with this is how long it takes a participant to read a word or a group of words. Uh, but the point of a self-paced reading is that usually, um, they can only see one word or a group of words at a time. And when they're done reading those, those words disappear and new words come up and they cannot go back. So um, that way they have to keep things in memory. So it's a way of tracking things in, uh, in an inexpensive way because we don't need fancy equipment like eye trackers. We just need a little bit of programming knowledge. So uh, our assumptions about this experimentally is that reading times uh, vary across a sentence. So when you have a complex structure or you have something in a sentence that is difficult or ungrammatical, then that area or region will take longer. So uh, when something is complex or difficult or ungrammatical, that region or word will take longer to read. Uh, it, it usually affects the regions or words after two. So this is our expectations about reading. So if we have people read on their own and they press a space bar whenever they want to see the next words, when they encounter something difficult, we expect them to take a little bit longer to read that word. And then they'll continue and then they'll take a little bit longer because they're still trying to understand what they just read. So they're like, okay, I get it. And they take a little bit longer to read the next couple words because they're still trying to process it. And then they speed back up to normal. So I'd like to demonstrate this to you. And this is something that we do at SFU. Um, and I'm going to actually show you a trial from a real experiment we did like four years ago. It was something that uh, I worked on at the time. Uh, with other people as part of the experimental syntax lab. So this is a lab that's still running and the lab does stuff with uh, pronouns and um, co-reference. So what pronouns mean in sentences and singular they and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, I have to demonstrate this for you. So we'll be going not at my pace, a little bit slower than normal, but uh, if you were doing this on your own, which you can if you download the slides, you would just go at your pace. So as soon as you finish reading the region, you would go on. But this is what it looks like. So you'd start a sentence like this, and then every time you press the space bar, words appear and disappear. So after the boy brought fresh water, 
from the kitchen quickly. It seems that they went on an early break. And that's it. Now, usually at this point, uh, we'd ask a comprehension question and we'd say, uh, did blah, blah, blah happen? And you'd say yes or no, just to see if you understood the sentence and read it. Uh, and then for each of those regions, so for each of these, like after there'd be a time in milliseconds. So we'd say, okay, like uh, maybe this took 300 milliseconds to read and that would be recorded. Then the next region, this would be like 400 milliseconds and that would be recorded and so on. So we'd have data for each of these different regions. Okay, so this is the full sentence that you were given. And uh, I think it, something like that. I don't know what the regions were exactly from memory, but they were something like these, 10 different regions. Okay, so I kind of said what we were testing, but in this experiment, we were testing pronouns. So after the boy brought fresh water from the kitchen quickly, it seems that they went on an early break. So what we were doing here was we were seeing if they could refer to the boy in this experiment. So when people encountered the pronoun they, did reading times increase? Or did they stay the same? Or did they think that they was someone else that wasn't in the sentence? So um, if readers had difficulties at they, then there was a complex structure going on here. They were having difficulties with it. It's not part of their grammar. If they didn't have any difficulties with they, that means that, yeah, they can refer to the boy. It's part of the grammar. Um, so uh, that experiment tested whether they could refer to the boy. So that was a study about singular they a few years ago. Okay, so just a little bit of practice and educated guessing. So just to learn some things. Uh, so are nouns and verbs content words or function words? Just to remind you. Um, nouns and verbs are content words. So these establish facts about the real worlds or things in the real worlds, their content. While words such as the, a, uh, and and are function words. So these are grammatical words. So function words and grammatical words, they mean the same thing. But these are important differences for processing. Because when you read words, Content words are slower than function words for processing. So when you press the space bar, it is longer to process content words than function words. And that's because the grammar is fast. Uh, but when you look at content words, you have to take a little bit of time to think about what they mean. So when you see a pronoun like he, she, or they, you expect it to be fast. So when it takes a little bit longer, then you're like, okay, there's a problem here. There's something going on with the grammar that isn't normal. Okay. Um, another fact about self-paced reading is that when you get to the end of a sentence or a clause, there's actually a bit of a pause. So people take time at the end of a sentence to think about what they just read and to get all that information together. So uh, there's an increased time to integrate that information. So when people listen to people talk or when they read things, um, once you get a complete idea, they don't just keep reading immediately. That They take time to finish that idea and understand it. So even though when you talk, you might continue immediately into the next word as a producer of speech, uh, you do take some time to actually comprehend it. I mean, not everybody does that, but and not everybody does the production thing where you speak immediately, but everybody does the comprehension thing.
And we can track that with actual spacebar presses, which is interesting. Okay. Um, so I didn't want to just show you the experiment. I want to actually talk about some results that are interesting, uh, which are called gender mismatch effects. So this is something we can talk about syntactically without really needing to know anything about syntactic structure. Uh, gender mismatch effects are something that has been studied for 20 to 30 years, uh, really even longer. But a lot of the data more recently is, is more reliable just because we have a lot more participants, a lot more uh, diversity around the world, a lot more. Uh, well, things are, are, are changing now, especially. And this is something that we also do at SFU specifically. So a gender mismatch effect happens when you have a pronoun being anteceded. So what I mean here by anteceded, uh, it points to. It points to a noun earlier in the sentence with a different gender. And normally this is a, like a different binary gender. So the example here is like the man loved herself. And I have these little ones down here. So what this means is that they are referring to the same thing in the world. So the man loved herself. They both have ones. This means that man and herself are supposed to be the same thing in the world. Um, so we say this is a gender mismatch effect because man is supposed to be masculine and herself is supposed to be feminine. And they're not the same, so it's a mismatch. Uh, here's another example. I knew a girl who knew he would take over the world. So if he is pointing to the girl, then this is a gender mismatch effect because girl is supposed to be feminine and he is supposed to be masculine. So this would be a gender mismatch effect. Now, in both of these cases, these what we call antecedents. So um, antecedents in these cases. So what is being pointed to? Have known gender. So that means if we say the word man, the word man in English has a gender on it. It is masculine gender. The girl has a gender on it. It's feminine gender. If you say girl um, and you say that girl is masculine, uh, English speakers would look at you and say, but that's not what the word means. The word has masculine gender in it if it's man. The word has feminine gender on it if it's girl. Like that's just part of the word. So that's why we say these antecedents are known gender. Now, what happens when people read these? So this is an average person reading them. So if you take uh, a thousand participants, uh, no matter their age, their gender, their exposure to English, as long as they're first language speakers of English, um, these are the general trends. When they get to the pronoun and read them, the reading times will increase. So they'll struggle a bit at the pronoun. So the man loved herself. Oh, at herself, it'll take a little bit longer to read them and understand it. Or I knew a girl who knew he would take over the world. At he, it'll take a little bit longer to read. And when participants are asked, is the sentence grammatical or not? Is it a natural sentence? Most participants will say it's not a good English sentence. There's a problem with it. So they'll say it's unnatural or ungrammatical. And usually it's like a seven point scale. So one to seven, and this would be around like a two to three where one is not good and seven is like really good. So this is like the general trend of where this would lie. So I mean, this is called a gender mismatch effect because the gender of the word does not match the gender of who it's supposed to be in the real world. So this is for man and girl. These are when the antecedents have known gender. But what if the gender of the antecedent changes? Like what if it's not man and girl? Uh, what if it's something like uh, secretary or mechanic? Something that has a stereotype associated with it. Okay, um, 
Now you might ask, well, why is this important? Why, why would a stereotype be important? What can a stereotype tell us about language? Well, a stereotype is going to tell us when gender is assigned in our mind. Because remember, gender is not only a real world thing, but it's also a grammatical thing. So gender is part of language. So when is gender happening in our brain? Is it happening while we're listening to a sentence or is it happening after the sentence has been listened to? Okay, so if we hear something like the secretary distributed an urgent memo. Now secretary stereotypically is feminine. So if you take a look at like uh, the media, for example, the media typically has secretaries being women. That's an old stereotype and it's still around. So when you encounter uh, he, he made it clear that work would continue as normal. And he is talking about the secretary. He is masculine. Okay. So is there a mismatch effect here? That's a question. Uh, what about my mechanic told me that she would come fix my car later this evening? It's a stereotype that mechanics are male. And she is feminine pronoun. So when the feminine pronoun refers to a masculine stereotypical mechanic, is there a mismatch effect here? So this is interesting. Because in terms of reading times, when people get to the pronoun, yes, reading times increase. People struggle at the pronoun. So while people are reading, they've already assigned a gender to, to secretary and mechanic. So people make assumptions as soon as they hear the word. There is a gender assumption in the mind as soon as the word is heard. So when you hear secretary or nurse or police officer or firefighter or mechanic, you're making an assumption in your head already. And that continues while you read the sentence. But after you read the sentence and you're asked, is the sentence grammatical or not? Is it natural? People say, yeah, it's okay. They think about it a little bit and they say, actually, mechanic can be female. Secretary can be male. There's no gender requirement on mechanic or secretary. These are just stereotypes. So on this one to seven scale, yeah, these are like a six or seven. These are fine. These are perfectly natural sentences. So during real live online processing, we assign gender to these nouns. But once we're done, we're like, oh, never mind. That doesn't have to happen. These don't have to have these specific genders. So actually, these are okay sentences. Would this be the case for gender neutral names as well? Are we talking proper names or are we talking like, like just things like customer and employee? Proper names. Uh, with proper names, you can use he or she for gender neutral names, like Taylor, he or she is fine. I don't have anything on proper names now, uh, but uh, we can do um, a last one. Let's just talk about unknown gender. When you have an antecedent with unknown gender, so like an injured patient or customer, you can use he or she, and there are no problems whatsoever. So when there's no stereotype associated with it and there's no known gender, whether you use he or she, there are no reading issues and there are no rating issues. Um, people will rate the sentence as a six or seven as natural and reading times are perfectly fine. So as long as there's no stereotype, nothing known about the gender, you can use whichever pronoun you want. Uh, in fact, uh, singular they is also accepted here. Even when someone consciously says, I cannot use singular they in this case, they can use singular they, and they will use singular they, and they can read singular they, and it's perfectly fine. Experiments have shown that they can use singular they, even when they say that they can't. They will rate it poorly, but they can read it just fine. And that is what my thesis has shown. Um, uh, but there is a slight difference. So this is just a, an aside thing. 
So you can use he, she, or they with things like injured patient or customer or employee, anything with unknown gender, but there's still a preference for generic he. So generic he is preferred over she and they, um, but they is almost as good as he. But you can use all three and people are just fine with it when they read it. There's no difficulties. And they'll all be rated as natural. Um, but there are some people who just don't like they for political reasons, but grammatically it's fine. So slight differences between, you know, uh, what type of antecedent you have, what type of noun phrase the pronoun refers to. But this is some information you get from self-paced reading studies. So I particularly wanted to show you this because this is what we do at SFU in the Experimental Syntax Lab. And this is also uh, quite modern. And when we talk about sociolinguistics in the next couple of weeks, we're going to uh, revisit this more from a sociolinguistic perspective rather than an experimental perspective. But in experiments, we do have data that says like, okay, there are some reading issues uh, with pronouns, depending on whether there's a match or not. Uh, and experimentally, we also know that singular they is okay in some cases. Uh, with proper names, singular they, people do struggle with it. Uh, experimentally, people do struggle with it. Um, but over time, that might change. So grammar does change over time, and as grammar changes over time, experimental results change over time. So are there any questions about gender mismatch effects? Uh, Diego, to answer your question about like proper names in general, um, if you can treat proper names pretty much like gender known antecedents, and a lot of the patterns happen exactly the same. And neut gender neutral names behave a lot like these unknown gender cases. So Taylor behaves a lot like customer, um, but they is just not okay with gender neutral names because, or sorry, with um, proper names, typically because we suspect that with proper names, uh, unless you know for sure that they are non-binary, you assume that they have binary gender. That's like the default assumption of human grammar, of English grammar at the moment. At least that's what it was in 2019. We'll talk a little bit more about that in sociolinguistics. Okay, uh, last little bit, well, and garden path sense, but eye movements. So space bar tracking is really cheap because we just need a space bar and a computer screen. But we can do this without space bars and we can just have people read stuff on a screen and we can track where their eyes are going. So, this is expensive, but we can do it. And uh, with reading, people's eyes can usually read about two to three words at a time, but eye movements are very jerky. So um, when you track it, you're taking snapshots. Usually about every two milliseconds, we track where their eyes are, but eyes move in like jumps. So they'll fixate for about 200 milliseconds on a spot, then they'll move for about 200 to 250 milliseconds, and then they'll snapshot on another space for 200 milliseconds. So it's very jumpy. It's like this sort of back and forth across the sentence as, as they go. And they'll even go backwards and forwards sometimes uh, to read. So uh, we call these movements saccades. So for, between dots, we call these saccades. And if it's forward, it's just called a saccade. If it goes backwards in a sentence, we call it a regressive saccade. So this is when you have to reread something. Uh, it says that you usually go about eight letters to the right with every fixation, but depending on which language you're reading, uh, it can be anywhere between 10 to 15 as well. And if you're reading a language like Japanese where you're going top to bottom, uh, you'll go down instead of left to right. 
Um, it is a high quality camera. It's incredibly accurate. Uh, the eye trackers we use in the linguistics department are something like $50,000 a piece. And you go in a headrest, your eyes are calibrated and it tracks the pupils and irises of your eyes, the light reflection. And it's, it's, it's a, usually a five minute calibration process and it's constantly being updated throughout the experiment. It's incredibly accurate. So uh, to show you an example of just what this looks like, the knight attacked the windmill on his donkey. Okay, so you can see where the fixations are. You can see what this sort of looks like. Um, the eye tracker here is not an expensive one that they're using. <laughs> it's a little bit cheaper, but the cheaper it is, uh, the less accurate the results are gonna be. So that's sort of the unfortunate part of using a cheaper eye tracker. So we can see the jumps. Uh, we can see a regression path. So for instance, he's going to four here. He's going to five here. After he reads windmill, he's coming back to attacked. So the knight attacked the windmill. He's reading windmill, attacked the windmill. And he's being like, hold on, attacked the windmill. Did I read attacked right? Windmill? Then he's going back to attack to make sure that he read attacked correctly. Because why would you attack a windmill? So he's rereading to make sure he's comprehended and read the right word. So I don't, uh, there's a little link to a study here. I'm not going to show you that study. Instead, I'm going to show you a study um, that we did in the experimental syntax lab. So just a 32 second trial. Uh, let me bring this over to the first screen. So here's an eye tracking study that we did. This is a not a reading study, but a visual world study. Every man said in front of the roller coaster that they were going for a second ride. The girls said near the end of the hiking trail that they were dehydrated. Every man said on the treadmill that he ran a marathon. Okay, uh, that came up at the end. It wasn't supposed to come up. Uh, so usually with an eye tracking study, uh, there's like this little fixation cross in the middle that you can kind of see here. Um, so we use a fixation cross to get them to center their eyes. Uh, once their eyes are centered, some other things come up on the screen, either words that they read or some images, and we present them audio, and then we track where their eyes are going. So in the reading study, we're just looking to see what words they're looking at, while with a picture study, we're looking to see where their eyes are going when they listen to things. So if they have trouble reading a word or... Um, understanding a sentence structure, two things happen. Uh, either they regress back to it, so they'll look back at something they had troubles with, or they spend a lot of time in a region. So um, if difficulties regress back to earlier regions, or spend a lot of time in the region. There's a game called Don't Blink that used eye tracking as an interactive element. That sounds horrifying. Any horror games that use eye tracking are just a bad time. That sounds like a horrible time. Absolutely terrifying. Uh, and uh, with eye tracking as well, the assumption is that when you listen to things in your head, uh, you'll automatically just look at what you listen to. So this is subconscious. Your eyes will be driven by what you hear. When you hear something, language is activated and your eyes immediately want to focus on it. This has also been something that has been proven by older studies. Okay. So uh, just some more information here, some facts for you. Uh, fixation times are longer for less frequent words. So when you haven't seen a word that often, you'll take a little bit longer to read on uh, to read it. Uh, when you read words, you're going to focus on content words rather than function words. 
Again, grammatical words, you don't need to spend too much time on them. Actually, when you read words in sentences, often you'll skip over function words entirely and you'll sort of read them in your peripheral vision. So you'll focus on content words and you'll read the function words out of the corner of your eye. That's pretty common. Uh, when you have difficult sentence structures, you'll have longer fixation times on those and more regressive saccades. So you'll spend more time looking at those difficult things and more time going back. And when you're a bad reader, you'll spend more time going back and forth than good readers. So the more difficulty you're having, the more time you're gonna spend going back and forth and fixating on difficult things. So good readers do things faster. Okay. Um, so I sort of just talked about this in the eye tracking uh, page, but uh, with visual world with eye tracking, you can do things with pictures as well. So you hear like an, an audio file and then as you hear audio, uh, your eyes will go around and look at the image of what you hear. And that's a way of tracking things as well. So when you hear a sentence, uh, maybe at the pronoun, we're, we're asking like, uh, when you hear it, what is it? And we'll see what you look at when it comes up. And based on what you look at when it comes up, we'll assume that's what you think it is. So uh, we can do things visually as well. It's just a small point. Okay, uh, brain things as well. So we'll just go over this quickly. Um, this isn't a, a big deal, but just talk about N400, P600 effects. Uh, we can hook up your brain with little electrodes. And these ERP event-related potentials uh, just measure the volts in your brain. So when activity occurs, electrical activity changes, and we just record that activity. So um, either it's positive, or it's negative. So in this case, this is positive, this is negative. Usually it's flipped, usually positives on the bottom and negatives up top, but linguists flip it. So there's two types of effects that we need to learn and we can summarize these very easily uh, for linguists. Um, N400 effects. So this is a negative increase in voltage. Uh, occurs when you have something that semantically does not make sense. So if you're reading a sentence and you get the pizza was too hot to cry. Wait, wait a minute. Pizza doesn't cry. So when your brain is hooked up and you read cry, what's happening is that your voltage in your brain 400 seconds later is being like, what the hell is going on? Why is pizza crying? So you'll get this 400, so you'll get this negative spike 400 milliseconds later after you read cry. So here is where you read cry. 400 milliseconds later, you get this spike in negative activity. And this isn't about where it occurs in a sentence. This is just about the semantics. So the word is weird. So you get a negative effect 400 milliseconds later. The N stands for negative 400 is how long it takes. So um, N400 is semantic error. Sorry, I'm gonna go a little bit faster through these last ones, but I'll just try to summarize these very concisely. Uh, P600 effect, a P600 effect this is a positive wave 600 milliseconds later. This is a syntactic error. So this could be like a gender mismatch effect, a garden path which is coming up or some ungrammatical sentence. So um, if you have a sentence, like I have all three examples here. So for instance, the door had been locks. The door had been locks. This is ungrammatical. It should be like the door had been locked. So when we see the door had been locks in blue, well, this is where we hear the word. So this is the word. Uh, this is about 
600 milliseconds later. And here we see this positive wave all the way up at the top. So this is a P600 effect. We see something ungrammatical, so we see a huge positive wave here. In the case of the famous chef was outlining, well, this is a semantic error. What do you mean the famous chef was outlining? This is a little bit weird. We don't expect this. So here, around 400 milliseconds, we see this negative effect. It's not super negative, but it is lower than the other ones. So 400 milliseconds later, we see a negative effect. And compared to a better salary that was negotiated, uh, this one is fairly normal compared to everything else. Okay. So you don't need to recognize what these look like on graphs. You just need to say N400 or P600, depending on what type of uh, effect it is. Why is one negative and the other positive? That's a good question, to be honest. That's something that I don't actually know. I just know that positive waves, P600 and N400 effects exist and why they exist and the balancing methods for how we control them experimentally. But I don't know why one is negative and why one is positive. I think linguists take too much for granted. Maybe the different location of the brain because it's voltage measured. Perhaps that could be it. The method, honestly, the methods themselves are not something that us linguists focus a lot on. It's more so just the results themselves and what the results mean and how to interpret them that we focus on. So that is a question I should probably be familiar with. Okay. Last thing. Garden pass sentences. Let's just talk about garden pass sentences. Then we'll finish this. Uh, last thing, so a couple minutes here. Look at these two sentences. Read these in your head. The horse raced past the barn fell. The first time you read that sentence, you probably don't think it's a grammatical sentence. In fact, even if you read it a couple times, you might not think it's a grammatical sentence. Uh, it took me two years to understand that the sentence was grammatical, which is embarrassing because it was explained to me in class uh, when I took this course, but it took me uh, much longer. So the first sentence, the young man, the ship, uh, we'll start with this one. Uh, the young man, the ship. This is a garden past sentence because when you first read it, you think the young man is like the subject. Uh, man is like the person. Man is a noun. And then you read the ship and you're like, hold on a second. The young man, the ship, where is the sentence? Uh, what's going on? So it's called a garden path sentence because you're led down the garden path. You're misled to misparse the sentence. So actually, man is a verb. When you read man, you're misled because you think it's a noun, but actually it's a verb. So the young man, the ship. The young is the subject, man is the verb, and the ship is the object. So you need to reparse the sentence to understand it. So the horse race past the barn fell. We need to reparse this. It's actually the horse, comma, that race past the barn, comma, fell. That's how we can interpret this. But the that is like not there. The horse, comma, race past the barn, comma, fell. That's what we mean. It was the horse that was raced past the barn, fell. But we don't need that that was. We can omit it. In English, it allows it. So here's some more examples with the spaces to help you. The horse raced past the barn, fell. The car driven past the barn, crashed. The man who whistles tunes pianos. So this one, is, this one is much more straightforward than the other ones, but it follows the same pattern. It's the same structure. The man who whistles tunes pianos. The car that was driven past the barn crashed. The horse that was raced past the barn fell. So commas can disambiguate this. 
So here's the last point I want to make um, for the entire lecture. Here's another sentence. While Susan dresses, the baby fell off the bed. When we say this out loud, it might be easy to understand, but when you read it, you're like, hold on a second, what's going on here? While Susan dresses, the baby fell off the bed. Well, when you see the word dresses, you're like, usually when I see dresses, it takes an object, like while Susan dresses the baby, while Susan dresses herself, while Susan dresses it. So when you read the sentence, you're expecting dresses to have something after it because of statistics, because of how you're used to seeing it. But actually, in this sentence, you're supposed to read it as, while well, Susan dresses, comma, the baby fell off the bed. But because of how you're used to seeing it, you misparse it as, while well, Susan dresses, the baby, comma, fell off the bed, and you're like, hold on, that's not a real sentence. That's not grammatical. So these are examples of garden past sentences where you're misled to think it's ungrammatical and bad because your initial interpretation, your initial parse um, is incorrect. So anyways, um, that is it for psycholinguistics. Sorry, it was a little bit rushed at the end. Uh, there's just so much to talk about this, uh, so much in psycholinguistics that I find interesting. So um, yeah, uh, there's a little bit on ambiguity at the end. We won't worry about that. So don't worry too much about that last slide. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, you can stick around. I'll, uh, the test two guide is on Canvas right now. So if you wanna check out the test two guide, uh, it is on there. I'll put out a video tomorrow that goes over it so you can see that. It'll be on the Canvas front page. Um, that is it for lecture, though. So you can go if you want to. Um, if you do want to stick around, here's what I'll do. So thank you all for coming out. I will talk two minutes about the test guide if you do want to stick around to hear it. Other than that, you can watch the video tomorrow if you don't want to stick around. So I'll see you next week if you don't want to stick around. Okay, only difference if you're still here for, for next week or for test next week. Uh, you'll have one hour for multiple choice, 27 questions. There's only nine multiple answer this time. So 33% is multiple answer drop down. 66.7% is multiple choice. More multiple choice than multiple answer. In fact, two of them are drop downs. So only seven multiple answer. Um, so 27 multiple choice, multiple answer total. 60 minutes for that, so a little bit over two minutes per question. Uh, 13 points for multiple or for a short answer, 45 minutes. Um, then all the information is on there for how many points it is. So you do have more time for this one, especially compared to the first test. Uh, and more multiple choice compared to multiple answer, so you can spend more time reading the questions and going over it and less time thinking about how many correct responses there are. Furthermore, every multiple answer question has two or three correct responses, uh, not just one. So all multiple answer questions will be two or three. So um, that means if you're confident in two answers and you just pick two, you'll always, or, and, and there's three available, you'll at least get partial points. Or if you're just confident in one and you just pick one out of two or three, you'll get partial points for sure. Um, that's all I have to say in this brief test guide. I'll post more on the video itself. But um, yeah, it's not cumulative. It's just language acquisition, neurolinguistics, and psycholinguistics. That's it. Four short answer, three from language acquisition, one from neurolinguistics. Very similar to the assignment for two with a short answer. Anyways, that's it. I will stop the recording, and if you have any questions about the assignment or anything else, I will answer them 